We intend to develop this resource we have in South Australia and become the world's biggest supplier of this mineral worldwide. Even if the price was 30% lower, we will still be making a very big profit there. You're in a space that not many people have heard of, let alone they thought about investing in it. What's the size of the market and what percentage of that do you think you could capture? Are you just lodging people? Are you a market of one? I mean, how competitive is that environment? Why do you think you can offload everything you produce? Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, do give us a thumbs up and also leave your comments below. It helps us understand the sorts of questions you'd like us to be asking the company, what you think of our performance and indeed what you think of the company's performance. And if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, for more videos like this, click the notification bell. And don't forget, you can get our videos in podcast form. You can get transcriptions and articles on cruxinvestor.com. If you're a Crux Club member, you can get access to the videos 24 hours before everyone else as part of our early access program. We spoke earlier today to James Marr, CEO of Andromeda Metals, an ASX listed company. They're in the Helios site, KLN business. Nope, me neither. But we, today we discover about the market, the size of the market, and the potential for these guys. They've just released the PFS. Share price dropped on the news. Not quite sure why. Uh, possibly because of the large retail following. We look at their business model, how they intend to drive the business forward. They've got enough cash to see them through to the DFS. Their CapEx is low, 28 million bucks required, 15 months uh, payback. The numbers look great. So take a look in the description below at some of the discussions that we have. Have anything interesting you in particular, click on the number. That's called a timestamp, and I'll jump you to that part of the video. Otherwise, enjoy what James has to say. James, how are you doing, sir? Fine, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, all good here. Now, I, I think we'd better let people know it's pretty late where you are. It's kind of midnight, and I think we kind of we didn't get quite get the timings right, did we? So. It's been a long day so far, yeah, and it's still going on, yes. Good. <laughs> we'll go easy on you, honest. Um, so why don't we kick off, give us that one minute overview of the business and then we can pick it up from there. Andromeda Metals is an emerging industrial minerals producer focused on haloisite kelin. We have a haloisite kelin project in South Australia, probably one of the world's biggest, highest purity haloisite kelins in the world. And this is quite a rare industrial mineral and a relatively high industrial mineral. Uh, so we intend to develop this resource we have in South Australia and become the world's biggest supplier of this mineral worldwide. Okay, simple as that. That's it, yeah. <laughs> okay, well look, <laughs> um, we always try to get into the minds of the management team with new stories, because we understand, you know, what they're about, how they think, you know, what, what their capabilities are. So. Can you just tell us a little bit about what, what you set out to do? Because this, this company has been around for a while, but this story really only kind of picked up in the, you know, halfway through last year. So how long have you been with the business and what were you brought in to do? Uh, so I was going back. Originally, um, the company was called, previously called Adelaide Resources. It was an exploration company, gold, copper exploration. So one, one among a, a number of, amongst a number of uh, junior explorers in Australia. Um, but about two years ago, the company picked up this project, uh, this Haloisite Kenyan project in South Australia. Uh, and at that point, uh, they approached me to join the company. Uh, I've spent uh, about 31 years now in the Kenyan industry, working in many countries around the world. Um, and they asked me to join the company two years ago. Uh, so I joined then. Uh, from that point onwards, we've focused entirely on the Putra site Kellyan project. So we joint ventured out our other projects. So the gold and copper projects are now joint ventures. They're all operated by other companies, um, but we still retain um, a share of ownership there. Uh, but all our resources and time now are built on this um, on this site Kellyan project. Uh, and we've gradually built a team around that. Um, we took, when I first started, we took it through to a scoping study stage uh, and just this week, in fact, we released our pre-feasibility study. Uh, so we've gone through, actually went through a scoping study stage, then we an updated scoping study, and then went to the pre-feasibility. Uh, and every point of that, uh, we've increased the economics, improved the economics, I, sh I should say. Um, and the project is now looking very attractive. And from this point onwards, we're heading quickly through, as, as, as well as quick as you can through, to a definitive feasibility study. 
uh, and mining approval. I think you're kind of getting into the, the sales pitch here with me and telling me what you've done. I'm, I'm interested yeah. in what you set out to try and achieve. You, what were you brought in to do? You, you've been 30, 30 years man and boy in the Kaolin uh, space. Um, obviously, this project is uh, Halia site, uh, Kaolin. So what, what, did, what did they do? want you to do? They've obviously found a project and thought, crikey, who knows about this? Because not many people know about it. Probably not very many people work in the space. So what were you brought in to do? Yes, yeah, so correct. Well, this, this, um, this deposit was actually discovered a long time ago by a, a, a Cornish geologist who I know um, about over 30 years ago now. And so it's been around a long time. But um, back in those days, uh, people were looking for a standard Kellin, so the non holoisite type for paper applications. Um, that was a big area, that was a big volume um, market for Kellin. Um, but when he discovered this material, he realized it was holoisite Kellin, which is a different version. Um, and back in those days, it wasn't actually um, being, being sought out at all. So it sat there for a long time. Um, nothing much was happening with it. A company called Minotaur Exploration then picked it up. This is about 12 years ago. Uh, and back then, they also were looking at, at it as a conventional Kellin, not a lawyer site type. Um, and back then, I became a consultant for them for about, for about a year. Um, I was working on other Kellin projects around Australia and other parts of the world. Uh, so I joined them for about a year. Um, but at that point, they didn't really um, accept the fact that it was a lawyer site Kellin and it was actually more valuable uh, than the conventional Kellin. And it needed a different strategy, different marketing completely and the markets aren't the same and the applications aren't the same uh, so i joined back that uh, so then i left the company and i went to work for an american kelling company for um, several years and after about eight years with that company uh, andromeda picked it up um, they spoke to the previous management so minotaur management and uh, looked at some work i'd done back then and realized that i could be a useful person to get involved um, but quite interesting back then uh, andromeda also their first thought was this is a, a high purity alumina project. Now, high purity alumina or HPA, you may have heard of that. It's in the Australian um, market. It's a very interesting material. There's several ASX listed companies who are chasing that. Um, and this is a new way of making high purity alumina from a Kellin, a Kellin material as a feed source. Uh, high purity alumina is used in a range of new applications, things like uh, lithium ion batteries, um, uh, smart smartphones, the glass, sapphire glass, and LED lights. So it's one of these um, sort of battery type minerals, uh, new technology minerals that's coming through. Um, and a lot of companies in Australia are chasing that from Kellin. Um, but when I joined the company, uh, I, I knew because it was Haloi site Kellin, um, it was worth more actually in its own right as a mineral. Why? Um, Why? Well, this. Kaolin is quite a common mineral in the world. Yeah, exactly. There's lots of it around. Yeah. Uh, Australia is full of it. Um, the whole country is covered in, in very large Kaolin deposits. Now, it, as a mineral, it occurs in flat type plates. So these are very thin plates, quite small. They're about maybe two microns across. Um, but in certain circumstances, these plates will roll up into tubes. Uh, so in certain environmental conditions, uh, normally, typically, it would be a very acidic water passing through it over millions of years. That changes the crystalline spacing in these plates, and it, it ro literally rolls up into little nanotubes. So you get naturally formed nanotubes, uh, and those nanotubes um, are very interesting. They have a number of um, potentially high-value uh, new applications, um, as well as being much higher purity than the normal kaolin. So during the formation process, the impurities get leached out of the kaolin, so it becomes higher purity kaolin, but it also becomes morphologically difficult, dif different. So this tube, these tubes end up being uh, about two to five microns in length and about 30 nanometers in diameter. Now these tubes can be functionalized uh, and used in um, a whole massive range of applications where, um, we look, where research is going to areas like uh, medical applications, construction, agriculture, um, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen storage. So a whole load of new exciting applications. Um, but the crucial thing here is that there's actually no genuine large commercial operation making the right holocyte anywhere in the world at the moment. So despite the fact there's hundreds of hundreds of patents out there being granted for applications, 
no one can actually make it. So what we have in what we have in our uh, at Kerry's Well, which is our Jork resource in South Australia, there we have a mixture of the holoisite and the Kelly, and so it's the tubes and the plates. Now this this um, hybrid mixture uh, is a material that's used uh, in high quality porcelain production. So it's in high demand for, for very high quality porcelain. Uh, this is top range, uh, you might know it's bone china material. Um, but the world supply of this material is actually dwindling and it's, uh, it's reduced to quite a small amount. The largest production in the world was in China, um, but those mines uh, are virtually closed down or run out of material. So there's a whole lot of companies out there that want this material not just China, around the whole world. Um, but at the moment, they, they cannot source that material. So what we have here is something that's um, very interesting to that initially short term to this ceramics market for the porcelain. Um, but also a bit longer term, we have this holoisite technology or nanotube technology. Um, they're actually known as holoisite nanotubes. Uh, and these have this whole range of new exciting applications. Uh, and, and the value of, so holoisite as a mineral um, in its own right, it sells for about uh, three thousand uh, sorry three thousand American dollars per ton. Uh, so it's extremely high value industrial mineral. Okay, so before we get get too much into the detail there, which I, I know you want to, um, but we've got to make this accessible for everyone. So let's let's kind of break this down. Okay, you, you talked about some assets which you have farmed out. Do they have any value or residual value for you today? Because I'm looking at your share price, you're about 70 million Aussie dollars, okay? So are you attributing any value to that on the books at the moment? Or is that something that which may come back and have some value to you in the future? It certainly will. At this point in time, the uh, other projects are, are not really included in an evaluation at all. So they're sitting there as very interesting assets. Now we have a, a, a gold joint venture with Evolution uh, Mining, very successful Australian gold company. Um, that one's in Queensland, and they're doing a lot of exploration. They're spending millions of dollars on drilling um, and proving up um, a gold resource there in North Queensland. Um, we have a, another gold project in South Australia with uh, a UK listed company called Cobra Resources. And uh, they, they're exploring that one down in South Australia. We have a couple of other gold tenements over in the Pilbara that we have yet to find a home for. Uh, and we have a, a copper joint venture in South Australia uh, with a company that's using a very interesting technique for copper mining, which is in situ recovery of the copper. Right. So we have those seen there in, uh, on our books, but they're not actually valued in evaluation. Right, okay. And, and what, why couldn't the company do something with them? I mean, what, what did they know about those? Or was it just a sheer lack of money and will in the market? It was. Fund it? Well, um, when, when the company um, changed from Adelaide Resources to Andromeda Metals, uh, a new management came on board, a new executive team, and they wanted a new project. They wanted to change the direction of the company. So they wanted to move from a junior explorer uh, to a producer of something. And at that point, they picked up this uh, Putra project in South Australia uh, and wanted to become a min industrial minerals producer. So the whole um, focus and direction of the company shifted across. Um, so when I joined, one of my first um, my first actions when I joined was to get the joint ventures um, set up and, and um, farmed okay. out to other people. Okay, We're, you've answered the question. There's no value attributed today. They may come back at some point and uh, have value for you in some way, shape or form, assuming people spend money to, to bother to do that. Okay, so can we just look at the size of the uh, Halicite uh, Kaolin market today? Where You said China was, it was one of the biggest producers. Um, what's the total size of that market today? Well, at the moment, if you look at the whole Kelin market, which is, includes Haloisite Kelin and normal Kelin, you're looking at maybe uh, 30 million tonnes of material size-wise in volume, mm -hmm. um, which uh, it goes across a whole range of different applications. Um, so it's a very large amount, but that is actually the whole Kelin worldwide business. Most of that goes in the paper ceramics and things like paint. But, but what about you? What are you focused on? Because that you said that, so it's in, Kaylin, it's in abundance, right? There's lots of it. So your niche is what? What are you focused on? What we've done, we focused initially on the Chinese market where most of that porcelain in the world is made in China. So when I first started, we went, we targeted those, those companies. We have a pilot plant where we made, uh, we made the product, went out there, got tested by these companies. Uh, and we actually signed up 
we signed, we've actually signed up almost 1 million tons a year of offtakes, mm -hmm. uh, letters of intent for offtakes. Now, these offtakes uh, are almost exclusively in China at this point, um, but they, are for th they were for three forms of the product. The companies in, in China that used to process this mineral no longer have the material to process. Their mines are shut down, so they want to buy the ore from us, the raw ore. So we signed up offtakes for the raw ore, um, but then we looked at the economics of that and realized that um, we can make a lot more money by processing it ourselves. So next stage, we decided to look at how we could process on site. Um, where we are on site, there's not much water around. So we thought it had to be a dry process. And that's something I've worked on for many years for Kelling companies in other parts of the world. So it's a conventional technology. It's been around a long time. Uh, so we did some, did some work with the dry processing and this is basically desanding the material because when it comes out of the ground, it's half haloisite kelin, half sand. So you take out half the sand, then immediately you're transporting half the material. So the costs come right down. So the plan was then to, to either sell that material as a, as a final product, as a dry process product, or to transport it to somewhere else like China, and then do a secondary refining process on it to get to the ultimate premium product. Right. Now that premium product, we also we also did that in, in, in the pilot plant, and we got offtake signed up in China um, for over two hundred thousand tons a year of that material. Um, so as a market in China, we identified about two hundred thousand tons, um, and we got the customers who signed up less intent to take that material. Now since then, we've expanded that um, to other uh, to Japan, other Asian countries, and we're now looking at diversifying around the rest of the world. Okay, so coming so back to the question, is, what's the total size of the market? You, you're telling me what you, you've kind of had conversations about and, and some letters of intent you know, prior to you processing it yourself. But you think everything that you could produce, you can walk into the market and, and sell this. There's no competition, no real competition. The price is set in the market and it's going to be easy breezy. Well, the marketing side of this is, is a little bit more complicated. And this is what a lot of um, people find it hard to grasp because especially within Australia people are used to having a mine operating and it might produce a copper mine might produce a concentrate then all you do is sign up an offtake agreement with a smelter takes the whole lot at a fixed price uh, over a certain period of time um, so with industrial minerals the process is very different uh, and this is what is is hard to grasp with some people um, because how, help us understand it, please. That'd be, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, certainly. Being a natural product, it will vary um, a lot, quite often from mine to mine and country to country. Uh, and each customer of this mineral will have their own requirements because they'll be used to taking a type of haloisite kelin or kelin from someone else. Uh, so their process has, has been developed around that particular mineral. So when you come in with a replacement mineral, it's, it's very rarely a one for one replacement. There's going to be some adjustments need to be made in the formulation. So what we have to do is we have to go to these individual customers. We identify the, the uh, usually the largest ones and the best opportunities. Go to them, and we have to sample them. Um, usually, with a small sample to start with, which if they like it at, a, at the small scale, the laboratory scale, then they'll ask for a bigger sample. Uh, and then that bigger sample they will then put through a commercial scale batch through their factory. Uh, they will then measure the properties of what they get from that. Um, but they will also then supply the final products to their end customers for approval. So it goes through quite a long lengthy process. Wait, how um, long so is that long in, in, in time? How long would that be? It's, um, it can take a couple of years from start to finish. Okay. Um, it, it just depends on um, a lot of factors because the, the companies don't like to uh, quite often interrupt their normal production. They like to do it in a, a normal downtime or a maintenance time or then schedule it in somehow. Uh, and also it depends on how quickly um, we produce the samples and also how quickly they test and how quickly their customers test. So we've, we've gone through the process at pilot scale and um, that's been very successful. They're impressed with what they see. They, they, they appreciate it. It's top quality material, um, some of the best material they've ever seen. Um, so now we're going through a process of next stage. We're doing it at the commercial scale now. So at this point in time, we're producing several tons in China and in Japan. These are going through commercial um, kaolin plants and they will give us several tons of material. Then that material over the next uh, few weeks and few months, that will go to these customers now uh, who will go through the process then at the commercial scale and that will give us final technical approval. So once that's finished, then we can get down to the talk about, well, 
um, supply agreements, offtake agreements, um, whatever you want to call them. Right. And so, the, so the structure there is that you know someone else is processing it because you haven't yet obviously built your your own processing processing facility. So at the point where you decide, actually, one, we can raise the money to build that processing uh, facility, presumably in some sort of demonstration plant and then commercial plant. You've got the money to do that, and you do. Will you have to go through this whole process again of people testing product because it's been processed somewhere else, a your facilities versus theirs? No, we won't. And, and the, the key here is that um, we have a very uh, relatively short time frame here into operation, and also a very low capex because our plan is to initially mine the material ourselves. And the mining is a very easy mining process. It's more like a quarrying process. It's a dry mining, very shallow. Uh, we will then ship that so it would be a direct shipping ore operation over to a refinery um, which Where will either is this? be uh, we've got refineries identified in china and japan so we've we've, we've diversified the risk there um, we've got several identified um, they're very keen to process the mineral because they've got nothing to process as i mentioned before so we've got those identified we'll ship it there and then the cash flow from that will be used to fund our, our own wet plant at site so the natural initial capex, uh, maximum capex we'll need is about 28 million Australian dollars, which is uh, pretty small looking at the, our numbers for our, our, our PFS study. So that'll be funded by the cash flow. Then we move to our own plant, which is producing material on site. Now that, that um, production uh, plant on site is now going to be a wet process. So we've identified through the course of our pre-feasibility study, we can access enough water to do it wet, which gave, gave us a lot of advantages. Um, so we now have something that, well, number one, this could be a final product from site in its own right. And we'll be, um, we'll be studying that very closely through our definitive feasibility study. Um, but it, at the very least, it'll be a material that when it goes to a refinery in, at the stage in China or Japan, uh, and we are also doing testing in America and in Germany as well, just a couple of bases there. Um, it, it will be something that processes much more easily. Uh, there will be very high recoveries and low processing costs for that overseas. Okay, so what's, what's, what's happening between um, now and then? You're, you've just done a PFS, so you, you released the PFS, your share price dropped. What was the problem? What, did, what, did, what was the market nervous about? Well, I think there's the two things identified here were uh, for the scoping, from the scoping study and the, and the pre-feasibility study, uh, we, we, we added on about three to six months on the timeline. Um, now, this was a, a safety buffer um, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, it has caused uh, a few things to slip uh, in the approval process mainly because that involves a whole lot of outside bodies and parties that are, are affected by the virus. So... But it must be more um, too, because if slipping three to six months is, is nothing, everyone's slipped three to six months yeah, it, during this time. So what, what else are people nervous about? What, what did they think was going on and what, what, what do they now think is going on? Well, that was, one, that was one thing that's been identified. And also it's the marketing aspect that they're not, as I said before, it's very hard to understand the marketing. They, uh, now the, the market over here is very, they're very used to having gold, for example, where there's a, just a fixed price in the market. You make your gold, you sell for a certain price. Mm. You know, this is not the same, so that's hard to build a grasp. Uh, and at the moment, we've got a uh, we've got a lot of shareholders, about four and a half thousand shareholders, but they're all retail. So they're um, they're day traders, and they um, so they think differently to you know, institutional investors. So what are you going to do about so that? A lot of trading goes on. What are you going to do about that? So at this point, yeah. So going forward, now we uh, we are looking uh, now now we've got the PFS out of the way. We are now looking to get some institutional investment in. Uh, so that's one goal of ours. We want to stabilise the registry there, uh, uh, and also get the message across that, well, we you know the time frame is still very short. Now we're talking about um, being in production possibly end of next year um, or early 2022, depending on how we cope with with the uh, this slight delay. Okay. Um, so it's still a very short time frame. So we got to and this happened this happened previously with the with the scoping study. The scoping study, the share price was uh, built very strongly right after the scoping study. Uh, on a lot of expectation, we released a very strong scoping study. We had better figures than expected, and then the uh, it, the price plunged afterwards. So it's done the same thing with the PFS. Um, so it's not the first time it's happened. It's not this time. It's it's less. Um, it's a le it's less of a build and a drop. So I think the confidence level is increasing. Um, 
but we still got to get that message across that it's um, that extra time is actually quite is insignificant in the scheme of things. Right. Um, and the marketing is actually well in progress. We're doing and we're diversifying the risk away from China. We're looking at other opportunities. That's also important. That is important. Okay, so so let's look at this. Why don't you run through some of the PFS numbers because there are some pretty big numbers in there. Yeah. So what we did was to, one of the key things we we did when we went from the scoping study to the uh, pre feasibility study. We increased the mine life quite significantly. It went up by seventy percent. So we had a 70 percent increase in mine life. So that gave us uh, automatically gave us a much life of the life of mine numbers then jumped up. Um, in the same magnitude. So the revenue went up uh, 74%, I think it was, which is up, up to over $4 billion, life of mine. Uh, the EBITDA uh, went up 86% to over $2 billion. Um, and the NPV has gone up uh, gradually from uh, three stages, and that also went up another 35% to a, well over 700, uh, 700 million uh, NPV pre-tax. So, uh, and, and the IIR, stayed at 175%. So again, a very, very strong number. So th now these, these numbers are for uh, industrial minerals project, extremely exciting, extremely high and unusual. And that is really uh, due to the fact that we have this much higher value haloisite mineral. Okay, and, and sorry, just to understand a little bit more about the market, because I'm asking about the market, because I don't think many people understand yeah. about it. So the, the price at which you did the um, pre-phase numbers Compared to where it is today, was that are they roughly the same, or did you apply a discount to it? I mean, how, what, how did you do the numbers? No, so we kept the same price. So we 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 did a lot of market research, and um, I got thirty years of contacts in the industry, um, so we have a very good feel for the market value, what's out there now, what's being used now, what the competition material is, and what that sells for. Um, so knowing all that, um, what we did was we. We took an average, we worked out what the range of, of the prices was that it sold out in the market. Uh, and the average we came out with was, uh, so the lowest in that range was $714 a ton. So what we did was we, we put uh, $700, this is Australian dollars, in per ton as our price. So we went right to the low end. So right through this whole process, we've, we've, um, we've made sure that we're very conservative. So lo low end in terms so of, what, was that a, what, a three year average, five year average? What, what did you use? That's just the average market price for that. Today, uh, so if, so today. Today, yes. Today's, today's market price. So we went for the low end of that range. We went for $700 a ton. Right. And that's been used in, uh, in all of our numbers. Okay, no, knowing that any institution that looks at this is probably going to discount at 30, 40%. It's, um, so in the, in the PFS here, we, we actually have included a, um, some sensitivity studies there. And even if the price was 30% lower, we will still be making some very, some very um, big profit there. So it's uh, it's a very robust financial model, right? So and can I can I understand because I because it's 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 a spec like I say if it was gold, easy conversation, right? Silver, lith lithium, battery metals, lovely. You're in a space that not many people have heard of, Halia site, let, let let alone never thought about investing in it. Okay, so and that, that'll be the same for the institutional guys because they don't all have coverage. Or unless you understand the space, you're going to have to educate them, right? So let, let's 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 try and do that. So the question I asked you earlier twice was, what's this? What's the size of the market, and what percentage of that do you think you could capture? Are you dislodging people, or are you a market of one? I mean, how competitive is that environment? Why do you think you can offload everything you produce? Uh, the, the, the total market in the application we're looking at worldwide, we're talking, it's talking about four million tons a year. Uh, so. Our uh, PFS is is uh, is based on at this point in time about two hundred thousand tons of that that we have people signed up for. So these are customers we know who want it. They've approved it. Uh, they approved it at um, pilot scale, uh, and they signed agreements for that amount. Now we we haven't spread it to other countries yet and other regions, and we we've been in the process of doing that. So, but at the moment that's what that's the whole market about four million, and we've identified that chunk. Right, and those those, those people that you've talked to are people with processing facilities because they need to keep busy. They currently haven't got anything to kind of feed their own um, uh, infrastructure. Is that right? 
That's right. At the moment, they're, they're getting bits and pieces from. There's right. a couple of mines going, and they're, they're, they've got right. some very inconsistent material coming out, and the quality is uh, suffering as a result. Right. They're getting a lot of rejects. So when we start mining and processing, then we will f we will fill that gap now where there's a there's a there's a vacuum there of uh, supply in certain areas. So we will fill that, but we are also we also start to replace the very inconsistent material that's being used by some people now, uh, and. To give you an example there, there's, there's a, a large company in China that has supplied this material for um, for decades, um, and they recognise as the world's they have been the world's benchmark for this for decades. Um, they are now uh, they now want to buy our material. They sign off take to buy our ore to process through their factory because they are running out themselves. So there's a clear demand for this, um, and what they like about us is um, the Chinese especially like Australian minerals. They view Australian minerals as very high quality. Uh, and also consistent and for them consistency is um, absolutely crucial and the fact that we have a 26 year mine life uh, on our first resource uh, means that they they have guaranteed stable supply of a high quality material which they need for about at least 10 years so th they like that uh, and th the reason and that for that reason that we are being pursued by a lot of people uh, customers are coming to us asking for material asking for samples quite regularly so that's, that's an ongoing process Right, okay. Let's come back to the strategies that you're going to employ because, okay, you've got a big resource. The one thing you didn't say about the PFS was the, the, the size size of this life of mine, et cetera. It's, it's, it's substantive for sure, uh, as well as well as the kind of margins here. But if I look at where you are today versus, you know, where you're going to need to to kind of get into processing your own stuff, there's, there's a way, way to go. Um, you're going to do a bit more conventional study on what you've got, are you? You're going to do a feasibility study on this? A definitive feasibility study, yes. So you're going to skip are, the feasibility yeah. onto DFS. We're going from we're going from pre-feasibility straight to DFS, yeah. And um, it's it's actually not a huge jump because we've done a lot of what we've done at pre-feasibility is at very high level, and because we're dealing with a very simple model and a very um, simple mining process, it's, it's it means it's really not that complicated. The, the main the main process we have to go through now, and the reason we can't start mining tomorrow is we it's the approvals with the government it takes the time. So that's the, that's the main, um, uh, I suppose, the rate determining step now is getting those approvals and permitting. Right. Uh, it's, not to, it's not the actual, um, uh, the mining of the mineral itself. That's a very easy process. It's just, um, it's, it's shallow, say it's shallow mining, it's a little bit overburned to scrape off. Okay. You go down and the mineral's sitting there. Okay, so let's talk about money. Let's talk about money. Um, how much money have you got today? At this point in time, we've got just under $3 million in the bank. Right. Um, but. We also have a number of listed options out on the market, which are well in the money. So they are being excised at the moment. Um, the excise date is November this year, uh, and we we should get another eight million dollars in by November. Right. So that means so that means we're, uh, there's about eleven million dollars total there. Uh, that's more enough to get us right through the, all the permitting approvals um, through the DFS and into the operational phase. Fantastic. So in which case, when, when it comes down to so between now and then, you, you've got enough cash to do what you want to do. You know that you're very clear about the process. You believe you understand the market because you're talking to the market. I get that. So what type of money do you take, this 28 million bucks? Are you going to say, do you take Chinese money and get a strategic partner with cash and access to a market there? Or do you take institutional money because you want to control your own destiny? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, at the moment, the board is considering all options. We we are actually um, getting bombarded with offers of money at the moment from various sources. So there's no shortage. Um, people, um, and this is from all countries, we've had offers from the UK as well as America and, and uh, Australia. So there's a lot of options out there, but we, we want to choose the best option um, long term for, for the shareholders, especially. So we want to look at um, you know, reducing any negative effects to, to existing shareholders, but we also want to make sure we, we don't get locked into any um, sort of. Uh, anything with too many hooks in it. Um, so we're looking at those options at the moment. Now we have got um, opportunity of getting, possibly getting a cornerstone investor in who, had, who could be an end customer or could be another minerals company. We have got interest from those, interest from minerals, other industrial minerals companies and also from our customers. What do you prefer? So it's, um, well, we're not 100% not certain there yet. Now there's pros and cons of both. You know, if you have a customer involved as a, as a cornerstone, that does potentially block out other customers. So we have to be a little bit wary of that. Um, Do you care? And also- Why would you care? Uh, um, 
because we don't want to lock ourselves out from a certain chunk of market. Now, if, if it's the right, if it's the, as I said before, there's these, these um, customers we're talking to, they're not one big massive customer. Now we do need a range of customers uh, and we need to uh, spread that risk. So having one there who might be blocking out other customers then would be not necessarily a good move. Um, but having said that, there's companies do operate in different countries now and um, now we've got we got options to maybe get someone in who will just look after one country, for example, and have some maybe some exclusivity to one country. So there's a whole lot of different options coming through there. And what they like is the fact that um, we have got this uh, very large resource at the moment, very large jork resource, but we've got probably two or three, possibly even larger jork resources around it that we're exploring at the moment. We'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Um, so let's, let's talk about you, you've got some letters of intent lovely but they don't really mean much and they're not the kind of people you want to be talking to anyway how do you convert some of these conversations again between now and dfs into something more meaty something more meaningful that the market can get a hold of and go okay it's not just a conversation this is real yes this is the process we're going through now and um, this is the why we're producing several tons of commercially represented material so it's very important that we've so we we did a bulk sampling operation. We took out uh, over 200 tons of material from the ground and we've been sending that around the world to be processed uh, to make sure we have uh, several tons of represented materials. This is material that's gone through a commercial plant. So then the customers who receive that know, well, the ore is very consistent. We've got a very large amount of this ore. It's gone through a, a standard commercial operation, a processing operation, nothing unusual about that. And this is what we can produce and this is what we can expect. So that's happening now, and, and that will be going out in, uh, it could be half ton amounts, or it could be ton amounts to various uh, ceramics producers around the world uh, to put through their factory and do their final approvals. Now, once they've, once they've done that, they're happy with what they've got, their customers are happy with what they're seeing. Then we get down to talking about some sort of binding agreements, supply agreements um, going forward. Yeah, but where, where are you it's, today um, is what I'm trying to get. You've explained the process could take two years, but where are you today? With yeah. the, what's the closest one? Again, just get the market excited because you've, you've got one over the line and there will be more to follow. So what are you doing? So at this point in time, we haven't got the large amounts out to them yet. They are being produced as we speak. So in China and Japan, those amounts are being are being produced right now. So it, it, it got slowed down by the COVID-19 um, because we, we it, it should have been finished in China before now, but the factories were on hold for a while. Uh, we switched across to Japan and then those, those factories went on hold for a while. So there's been a slight delay there. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because uh, with our, our sort of project, the customers also want to know that we are almost certainly going to go into production. There's going to be no hitches in between. So as we move closer and closer through our own studies and through the permitting process, um, we really want to get those customer approvals and those binding off takes in phase with that. So it comes in the right timing. It sort of matches with the uh, customer's expectations. Okay. Um, so that, that will happen over the next so the next few weeks and months. Those samples will be going out. Right. And um, we'll, okay. just, we'll start that approval process. But it's a well-trodden path. There's, there, there should be no surprises. You're saying the demands there. Yeah. You feel that the pro, there's no erratic, volatile behavior with Heliocyte, uh, KLN. It, it's a fairly steady price. You're not going to see any shocks in the market there. No, it's, it's been uh, it's, it's been growing steadily year on year for the last 25, 30 years. Right. Um, okay. It's it been a industrial metal. It's one of the things that it just it, it grows slowly, but it just keeps growing and growing. So perfect. There's been no um, big setbacks. It's the numbers look great. You've just got to go through a process of of getting these things over the line, and people can either get in get in now, uh, get in early, or they can wait for you to actually deliver some of these things. That, that's up to them. But why don't you talk about a couple of the other the the joke, uh, projects that. The, Short level projects that you've got. Yeah, so around the uh, our resource we have, have at the moment is called Kerry as well. Now that is what the uh, the PFS is focused on, um, but we have a lot of area, uh, large tenement areas there, and around that we have um, a couple of other areas very close by, within about four kilometres away, which look like they are actually bigger and higher purity than what than the one we've got focused on a PFS. Um, so it, it's potentially we're sitting on. Um, vast amounts of this material and also higher purity. So at the moment we've done a lot of drilling. Um, we've got uh, drilling done actually in three other areas. So we could end up with three more resources of this material. And one that's close by is quite exciting because it's higher purity haloisite. 
And as you, as you increase in the purity of halosite, you increase in the value of the material. So it goes from the hybrid material that we have uh, and our current resource is about 20% halosite, about 80% kelin. That, that gives a value of about 700 Australian dollars per ton. Now, if you go to 100% uh, halosite, it goes up to 5,000 Australian dollars per ton. So there's a range going up to five, between 700 and 5,000. Uh, and the resource nearby that we have um, looks like that is in that range somewhere. And it looks like it could be purified up to 90% plus, which means we automatically leap into something that's worth uh, multiples of what, we, what we're planning to, set, to, to uh, sell a material for at the moment. Uh, so that's very exciting. We don't know how much is there, there yet. So the work is ongoing now. It's in for testing. The drilling is all completed. It's in for testing right now. That's what there's one called Condor Energy. That's, that's the closest one. Um, but we also have uh, another uh, historic resource of the same material, um, which is about 300 kilometers away. That's an old historic resource of 12 million tons that we're now upgrading back to a up-to-date resource. So that's also in for testing, all drilling is done. And we also have another prospect um, called Camel Lake, which is in South Australia again. That's been sampled twice in history. Uh, both times it's been uh, shown to be the best holocyte that's everyone ever seen anywhere in the world. Apple, absolutely perfect material. Uh, and it's just below the ground as well. It's literally, you can dig it with, up with a shovel. Uh, so that is very exciting. And we want to get to that one soon as well, because that one is absolutely perfect for these new applications that we're looking at um, in all our research, research and development work that's ongoing. So the plan is to start the project off with the hybrid material that carries well, that's a 20% holocyte. And then we will look at moving across to higher purity materials. Uh, if that can be transported to our wet plant, which we're going to be building, that could possibly be purified there and give us a high purity low site from site. So that'll be the next phase of the project. Okay, good. So th there's, a, there's a lot coming, following behind. You've got to focus on project number one, get that over the line, get that into revenue. That, that's the idea. And if you can do that, I'm sure there'll be no end of money available for the rest of it. Assuming some of these patented technologies start actually generating large uh, demand for you at some point in the future. But that probably won't be your yes, problem well, by then, will it? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's, it is, um, so Holocyte is the most researched claim in the world by an exponential amount, huge amount of research. Uh, there's 8,000 papers now, on the, uh, research papers on it at the moment around the world. Uh, and hundreds of patents have been granted for its use, but say so no one can produce it in large amounts. So we stand to be the world's, possibly the world's biggest and first producer of this material for these new applications. Okay. Uh, and we're having material tested at the moment. We've, so we, start, we sent samples out at the moment around the world of the um, higher purity material that we have nearby. Um, it's not the ultimate purity, but it's, an, it's high enough purity to be um, giving good results. So that's being tested in, in all these new applications right now. Uh, and that includes the medical applications, it includes um, carbon capture and storage, lithium ion batteries, um, water purification. Yeah, it's all, uh, it's, it's, it's all good. I think, you know, and what you're going to have to do is work out if you can, you can uh, provide it economically. The grade, you know, grades, grades one thing, getting it at scale is another. So I mean, you've got some, some nice work ahead of you, I'm sure you'd agree. Certainly. Well, the good thing is we've got the, uh, we've got the short term um, opportunity there. But they've got this medium, medium term, um, which is a high, uh, the, the halocyte nanotube technology. And then we've got longer term, we've still got high fluid lumina. And uh, we've done the testing on that and we've we've proven that our halocyte material is the best possible feed for that high pure lumina process. Okay. okay. Just gonna finish on this. What are you going to do about getting institutional investors in today? Because it seems if you can't get a good result off of a of a what looks like a very strong PFS, you've got a problem. So what are you doing about the institutional component? Uh, well we're now actively starting to talk to some of these people. Um, now, we, we did talk to some before, but a number of them did say they, they couldn't invest until we had the PFS finished. That was a trigger for it. So now we have the PFS finished. Um, attention will be turned to attracting those people. Uh, and we are actually talking to some already. So uh, now we've, uh, we, we had to reach a certain point of confidence for them. Uh, and for some of them, they actually couldn't. It wasn't, they weren't allowed to do it. Um, so that will happen now. Uh, and we've had a, uh, discussions uh, even today with some potential people. So going forward, that will happen. Uh, and we just gotta make sure we, 
we uh, get the right get the right ones uh, and get the right level as well. How, how do you get them in in volume quickly? Given this is a retail story, when you're not going to need to raise money anytime soon. Well, we yeah, we we've got um, we use Pack Partners, who, who's our corporate uh, have our corporate mandate, and they have a number of these people they're talking to already, and um, they were waiting to, until the PFS was complete. Um, but we do have we do have people coming to us at the moment saying they have institutions who are very interested at this point, uh, and we now have to go and make uh, presentations to them. So that hasn't quite happened yet, but it will be happening uh, over the next few weeks. But that's not my point. My point is, how do you get them in quickly enough to make a difference to you without issuing a lot more shares? You're already sort of standard Aussie 1.5 billion-ish level. So how do, you, how do you get them in at some kind of scale quickly so that you, you have a slightly different profile, different attractiveness level? Well, we don't feel that we have to do that too quickly. You know, so we've got, we're sitting on, we're sitting on $11 million, which you know, is for... Is, it's more than enough we need for everything we need to do right now. So we don't need to rush on that. Um, so we can take our time. So we are speaking to, we are speaking to advisors on this, specialist advisors, uh, and they are, they're guiding us in the right direction. So the board has a certain amount of experience, but we feel that we need to get on some specialist, specialist advice on this. And those people are being approached right now. Beautiful. James, thank you so much. It's so late there. I feel so bad that we're speaking to you at this time. <laughs> it's quarter to one, everyone. So. Uh, well done, James. Uh, thanks for answering all of our questions, uh, you know, straightforward and honestly. Appreciate that. Um, do stay in touch with us. Let us know how things are progressing. Seems to be a lot of, you know, quite exciting things happening and coming forward. We'd love to hear about them from you when they do. Certainly will, yeah. Pleasure.